um, before we start. All right. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Um, we uh, just a few housekeeping notes about the Zoom before we start. So we have chat enabled and the Q and A feature enabled. Uh, we will have plenty of time at the end uh, for Q and A uh, from the audience uh, that Jamie will will be answering. And if you want to have, if you have a question that you want to be answered by uh, by Jamie in that period, please put it in the Q and A. You can also upload, uh, or sorry, you can also upvote um, the uh, the Q and A. Uh, you can upvote questions in the Q and A. Chat is for comments, resources. Um, we're leaving it there to be interactive. But any questions you put in the uh, in the chat will not necessarily be seen or answered. So. Um, with that, uh, I'm going to welcome Jamie Alexander, Jamie Beck Alexander, uh, the director of Drawdown Labs at Project Drawdown. Uh, thank you for joining us, Jamie. Uh, and you are an amazing resource to the community. Drawdown is an amazing resource uh, that we recommend to so many um, people uh, who are getting into climate. And we're grateful for you to join us uh, today for this session. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for having me, Jonathan. And thank all of you for being here with us today. And you know, I think for grappling together through this wild time um, in our economy and in, in human history, where you know it feels like there's so much uncertainty and instability in certain sectors. There are layoffs, there are you know, questions about our companies' heroes or villains when it comes to climate change. And yet at the same time, there is so much work to be done to build the world that we all want to live in together. Um, so I am not here to tell you to, you know, stay in your current job or, you know, don't go work for a big corporation or only go work in climate tech. That is, of course, your personal journey. Um, but what I am here to say is that we need you from wherever you are, wherever you sit, whoever employs you, you know, whatever your calling is, we need you. Um, so it's really an honor to be here with you today. Um, I'm Jamie Alexander, and I'm really thrilled to be talking about my one of my favorite topics, uh, making every job a climate job. And that, you know, it's really not um, just an idealistic phrase. You know, it's really, it's genuinely true to do the work in front of all of us to address climate change uh, and build a better world and, the, you know, within planetary boundaries literally requires, you know, work from every sector, all of us from wherever we are, whatever we do for a living to bring our skill sets to bear. Um, so with that, I want to start with just a little bit about um, the organization that I work for, which is called Project Drawdown. Um, we're a nonprofit organization that exists really to share with the world what the solutions to climate change are. Um, and so when we say every job is a climate job, it's because we know that there are all these solutions out there to climate change, and we need lots of different skill sets and people in the world to scale them. Um, you may know us from our 2017 book called Drawdown um, that became a New York Times bestseller. And um, we now work with businesses, investors, cities, and governments um, across the United States and around the world um, to help you know, equip people to scale climate solutions faster. Um, so to start off, um, I'm going to show you a few climate-related successes in the private sector that have happened over the last few years. And uh, when I show you these, these, um, these examples, I want you just to think about what they might have in common. Um, so these three things I'm going to show you are climate-related successes that we've seen in the private sector in the last few years. And I want you to think about what they all might have in common. So first, um, last year, a pretty big um, global corporation electrified its entire fleet of vehicles. So going from internal combustion engine cars to all electric fleet. Um, I can't mention the name of the company because the story of how this happened is not public, but that's the first example. 
Second example, um, Amazon's climate pledge. So Amazon a few years ago committing to net zero by 2040. Um, I'm not saying this was a perfect commitment, but I'm noting that it was a big deal for Amazon to take this step. So that's the second example. Um, and the third example is um, a product called Salesforce Net Zero Cloud, which was launched a few years ago um, and is really Salesforce using their own superpower and selling it to other companies so that other companies can accelerate their decarbonization journeys. Um, okay, so what do you think these three things, these three examples of some pretty significant climate moves made by big corporations, what do you think they might have in common? If anyone has any ideas, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, what do these three things have in common? Well, we're not going to, um, I'm not going to read any um, of the chat now in case anyone dropped anything in there, but um, they all happen, all of these three things happen either directly or indirectly as a result of employee power. So these three initiatives were either instigated by or the brainchild of an employee, not the chief sustainability officer, not someone on the sustain on the leadership team. This was not a job assigned to them, but these are cases of one or more workers seeing an opportunity to help the company move faster in its climate journey. In the case of Amazon, it was a group of employees who banded together to write the Amazon board um, a, a letter to set that they, you know, that they as employees wanted to see Amazon move faster on climate. Employees from the warehouse to the marketing team signed that letter. And then months later, Amazon announced its climate pledge. Um, we know that in the case of the electrified fleet, we know that it was a fleet manager. So an individual who worked in the, you know, on managing the fleet of cars for a large corporation, not a sustainability executive, but a fleet manager who ran a back of the envelope calculation and showed his bosses that it would actually save the company money over the medium term if they electrified their fleet and it would imp it would be better for his health and his co-workers health. Um, so those are examples of how even if you don't have sustainability or climate in your job title, you have the power to change things. Um, so today we're going to explore two categories of how I think about making every job a climate job. Um, and these two categories are, so on the left, building new systems to help the world address climate change. Um, and on the right is leveraging the existing system to stop climate change. And those may seem like not, you know, not so different things, but we'll, we'll dive into both of those a little bit today. Um, so building new systems to address the climate emergency. This is, you know, Climate tech startups leaving the system, you know, maybe leaving a tech, maybe maybe leaving a tech job to move to climate tech. So kind of purposely and intentionally moving toward toward building the world that we want to move move toward. Um, the other category is saying, hey, we also need to sort of you know infiltrate and transform this existing system. So the incumbent, you know, corporations in the world which happen to still have a lot of power and influence for better or worse um, on the climate crisis. So this is employees who are working to change their company from the inside. Um, and these two approaches are not at odds. We need both of them, we need all of it. Um, so these are super complimentary. Um, what you see on the screen here is a depiction of the 100 biggest climate solutions um, that Project Drawdown has, has analyzed. So we need to get these solutions scaling in the world quickly, safely, and equitably so that they displace um, the, you know, the old kind of obsolete ways we've been doing things that are just not compatible with um, thriving life on our planet. So we need people from both of those bubbles that I showed um, scaling these climate solutions. But I wanna give a quick high level overview now of what these broad climate solutions are um, because we need people trained and equipped in jobs and position to scale these climate solutions directly. Um, so as I'm walking through these climate solutions, I invite you to just you know, kind of think about um, what job, you know, how these might apply if they do to the job that you're in now or sort of what what appeals to you or what, um, you know, what resonates with you um, if you're searching for a climate job. So first, um, electricity. So electricity is the heaviest emitting sector in society, but it also powers our lives. So we need to transform um, our electricity production and improve energy efficiency. So that means we need people who can install solar panels and wind turbines and 
all kind of renewable energy. That'll take direct implementation, like people hanging solar panels and, you know, startups and, you know, companies that can help all of it and, and financing that can help all of this scale faster. Um, we also get to transform our food and agriculture sector. So food and agriculture and the way we use land is the second biggest emitting sector globally, um, which makes it a huge opportunity for climate solutions and climate tech. So we need people implementing, you know, solutions to grow food more sustainably, um, regenerative agriculture, something called silvopasture, new ways of feeding people while absorbing carbon. Um, we also we need to shift our diets to, you know, more plants and less meat um, and much, much less food wasted. So right now, one third of the world's food is never eaten. Um, so we need startups and farmers and cooks and all kinds of people working on this solution, redistributing food waste um, and, you know, and, and, and wasting less food to begin with. And this, this can happen directly through new technologies um, coming out of the climate tech space as well. Um, the next major climate solution sector that we, that we've analyzed is refrigerants. So refrigerants is a huge climate problem with a lot of amazing solutions. Um, this is all about how we keep people cool as temperatures rise um, and how we, you know, and the refrigerators that, that we have in our homes. So transforming, you know, this solution and uh, this, this source of emissions into solutions will take engineers, builders, construction workers. It also needs large scale investment and policy change. And again, technology will help accelerate new approaches here. Um, the next biggest emitting sector um, globally is transportation, um, and transportation in, in the United States is the biggest emitting sector. Um, so we need to not only, you know, shift to electric vehicles, we also, you know, get to think about how we, you know, remake and reimagine our cities so that they're more equitable and walkable and bikeable, um, so that they connect people without having to get in a personally owned vehicle at all. Um, so we have solutions here, um, enabling people to get from place to place without air polluting emissions. Um, and again, jobs are here for lots of different skill sets and roles. We also um, need to transform our relationship with nature, how we exist together with instead of at odds with nature. Um, because right now, nature in um, on, on land and in the ocean actually absorbs about 30% of the emissions that we humans put into the atmosphere every year. So restoring and preserving our, you know, our forests and oceans are absolutely critical, um, as are, you know, skill sets and technology that's needed to do this. So that'll take, you know, farmers and ranchers and, and you know, all kinds of technology um, to preserve and restore our existing um, sinks, carbon sinks. And, um, and lastly, so this is sort of the last um, area of our broad climate solution sectors, is access to equitable and reproductive health care and high quality education for women and girls around the world. These are fundamental human rights, and they're also climate solutions. Um, so that'll take, you know, teachers and healthcare workers and technologies and partnerships to help accelerate more women and girls having access to high quality rights-based education and reproductive health care. So that was our whirlwind tour of Project Drawdown's kind of at the highest level, our climate solutions. Um, you can go on our website and all of the all of the data and everything around those solutions are available for free. Um, but so I went through those really to um, to underscore that we need people in jobs implementing those climate solutions directly. Right. Trained and in jobs implementing those solutions. Full stop. Um, but, you know. We also need to, and that's, you know, I think part of building new systems to stop climate change. We need to like accelerate our work toward the world we need. Um, but moving to the bubble on the right, we also need to pivot and transform the existing system, the sort of incumbent businesses and structures that we have in place today, which happen to still have a lot of power and influence for better or worse. Um, this may not mean hanging solar panels or building a new climate tech startup, but it may have just as much, if not more, potential for impact. So how does an employee from any part of any business use their existing role to help change their company from the inside? That's what the second bubble is all about. Um, so specifically, you know, kind of 
finding ways that your own role within a business um, can be brought to bear and using your influence as an employee to help move your organization faster. This is especially powerful um, for those who work in larger institutions or corporations where the influence that can be brought to bear when you work for a major corporation are massive. Corporations have political clout, financial resources, cultural influence, a lot of resources that can be brought to bear. And employees can help shift all these things to the side of climate action. So imagine if the biggest companies in the world were fully supportive of climate policy, were fully supportive of, of the biggest banks in the world shifting their finances, were fully supportive of all of their employees, you know, working on climate change. So that's the future, you know, that's that's what employ that's that's what's possible when we think about, you know, employees organizing and and bringing their skills to bear for climate action. And employees are, you know, the backbone um, of any organization or any company that they work in. Retention matters, um, recruitment matters, having the best talent inside companies matters. Um, so I really think that climate aware employees are in a very important and exciting place right now to help change companies from the inside. Um, so how to apply a climate lens to your existing role? Um, well, my team at Drawdown Labs in the past year um, came up with something that we call the Drawdown Aligned Business Framework. Um, and this was really our effort at getting out on the table um, many more of the ways that companies can use their influence, clout, and resources to help influence the climate crisis beyond just emissions reductions targets or beyond just, you know, thinking about net zero. Um, and identifying all of these areas across the business, it actually helped for us to connect more departments and more roles to climate action. So I'm going to just very quickly walk through a few of these leverage points um, to give a few examples of how different roles within, um, within a company can take climate action. And hopefully, maybe this will spark some ideas for your own specific role and how you might you know, communicate about and advocate for climate through the lens of your current job. Um, so we'll start with um, stakeholder engagement and collaboration. So businesses operate in a complex ecosystem, right? They, they don't exist in a bubble. They have employees, customers, shareholders, their boards of directors, and the, you know, the communities in which they operate. So how are companies bringing in and empowering the climate superpowers of these st stakeholders? How are they using that access and influence to help scale climate solutions? So if you work on human resources, you know, you can help create a culture of climate action throughout the company. You can help tie different employee roles to climate action in job descriptions. If you work on the legal team or in the general counsel's office, you can work to make sure that the board is climate competent and has oversight of climate impacts um, at the board level. If you work on external affairs or partnerships, you can work to make sure that your company is showing up for climate action in the local communities in which it operates. And those are just a few examples. Um, the next kind of leverage point that companies have to influence climate change are through their products, partnerships, and procurement. Um, so companies, you know, influence our climate through the products they make, the ways they procure supplies, and the partnerships that they enter into. And so taking a closer look in these areas and their climate action is a, is a huge leverage point. And it will require people outside of the sustainability function to help address it. So investigating what kinds of partnerships your company has with external groups could lead to climate action. You know, is your company partnering with the fossil fuel industry in some way? Might you be able to raise that concern to leadership? Um, are the products that the business makes contributing to the problem? Might you be able to raise that concern to leadership? Um, can products be designed better or more sustainably? That brings in, you know, designers. Can you use your, you know, your business, the clout of the business, or if you work on the procurement team or in supply on the in supply chain, um, can you look at how you can influence your suppliers to set emissions reductions targets? So how can you use the influence of the company to create ripple effects um, throughout the economy? And again, this line of thinking brings in procurement teams, supply chain, marketing teams, partnership teams. Um, the next kind of leverage point that companies have to influence climate change is um, investments and financing. So money holds a lot of power, right? And a lot of that money is still being funneled toward fossil fuels and other extractive industries. 
Um, so capital is a huge catalyst in, you know, in scaling and financing climate solutions. Businesses can influence their banks by trying to encourage them to stop financing fossil fuels. Um, businesses can, can provide green 401k options for their employees. Um, so thinking about where the company's money is, go it's, is going and what it supports brings in finance teams, um, benefits, you know, thinking about green benefit options brings in human resources and operations teams and many more. I'm going to skip over a couple and go to climate policy advocacy. So, you know, like it or not, co companies have a lot of influence on policy and influence on our, our you know, on our on our legislators and um, at the state and federal level. Um, and so how businesses show up to support climate policy um, and stop, you know, obstructing climate policy in the cases where they do is really powerful climate leverage point. Um, and so employees can, you know, can ask their, can bring, raise concerns at, you know, at all staff meetings. Are we supporting, you know, a major piece of climate legislation or are we supporting, you know, climate clean energy bills at the, at the state or local level? Um, th these are really powerful, powerful leverage points and employees have a lot of power inside the company in asking their companies to support these climate bills. Um, and the last one I'll cover today is um, what we call business model transformation. This is, you know, how is sustainability actually embedded in the core model, the core business model? So sustainability, you know, cannot be an add-on. It needs to be kind of central and baked in to what the company is doing. Um, and that brings in, you know, thinking about what climate solutions the, a business might be able to work on or help scale in the world. Maybe a business needs to like stop doing certain kinds of work that are that are contributing to the problem and move into using their technology to scale climate solutions. That'll bring in a lot more skill sets, a lot of like product design skill sets and coding and who knows what else, but thinking more, more generatively about the core business model and baking that in and having climate central is a really exciting um, climate leverage point. So this is the full framework. I didn't cover all of these today, but it just these are this is available on our website. Um, but I showed that to say that, you know, there is a lot of stuff to be done. There are a lot of ways their companies have a lot of like tentacles out there in the world that can be leveraged to accelerate climate action in the world. So there's a lot to be done and there's a lot of jobs that and you know different departments throughout the company that that this kind of framework brings in. A lot of ways that they companies can use their resources and clout to help the world address the climate crisis. This is another depiction of it which I wanted to show um another depiction of sort of how different different um leverage company le leverage points can be used to scale climate solutions. Because it really, you know, looks at it really, bring, you know, is a more holistic and integrated framework, and it starts to bring more people from more parts of the business to help. So, for example, when we look at, um, you know, bringing in, making investments and financing a climate solution, that brings in, you know, not just the sustainability team, but finance teams and marketing teams and HR and coding and designers and you know, and and on and on. So when we when we actually expand our view of what climate action looks like inside a company, it brings in so many different parts of the business. Going from you know one small team that's trying to do it all, maybe a sustainability team, to being an ecosystem um, of new ideas, of new skill sets, of diverse perspectives all kind of using their superpowers from whatever department they sit in, from whatever their job function is, to help transform the business from the inside. I mean, I want to share here some work that we just put out um, earlier or last last year, um, some what we call job function action guides. So this is, we get super tangible about, you know, if you work in government relations or public policy, there are things you can do. We have checklists for like ways that you can integrate climate into your job. If you work in HR or operations, there are things to do. There, are, you know, you can bake in um, climate into you know workplace cult culture and recruitment and job descriptions. If you work in marketing, there is a lot to be done um, around around climate action and baking that into your job. 
Um, and so those are all free resources on our website. Um, but so, you know, I really just recommend starting if you want to, you know, if you want to stay in your job and you don't work on the sustainability team and you work inside of a company, you know, there are things to do. So first, you know, I'd recommend, you know, looking into what is what is your company currently doing? Does your company have a, you know, a stated climate commitment or sustainability team? Get, you know, I would, you know, kind of get educated on what that is, understand what, you know, what the what their current climate strategy is. Next, identify who has decision making power. So does the entire does that entire climate plan rest with a sustainability team? Are there other points of influence throughout the business? Um, some employee groups do power mapping to understand, you know, who has influence over a decision for a company to support a climate policy. How can we reach that decision maker? Um, and then, you know, find your people. Who are there other employees? I'm sure there are inside your business who are climate concerned and want to contribute. Get in touch with them. Build employee groups. Um, this can go well beyond green teams and well beyond putting recycling bins, you know, in, in your office to actually looking at how you transform a company from the inside. Um, I really think this is one of the most exciting um, times to be inside, you know, inside of a, a, a company to help like turn that ship around. Um, and so I'll end by saying, you know, we have these climate solutions at our fingertips. We know what they are. We know what we need to do. We need people scaling these climate solutions directly, building new systems of the future, leapfrogging, you know, what we've done in the past and the incumbents. And we need warriors inside of our existing systems, challenging it to move faster and equipped to bring climate action into every part of the business. So we need both sides. We need we need all of it because um, as we're seeing everywhere all around us, um, the climate crisis is flooding and uprooting every aspect of our lives. So responding to it with the same level of expansiveness is the only way forward. We need to enable this work to happen everywhere by everyone at all levels. And we need to make every job a climate job. Um, so let's open the floodgates. And with that, I'm going to ask Jonathan to come back on the screen and we can field any questions that may have come in or um, have a discussion. Thanks so much, Jamie. That's awesome. Um, I put some of the links that you talked about in the chat. And um, if folks are interested in getting the uh, whole presentation, just please email us at uh, hello at climate career week. I'm saying this as I type it. <laughs> uh, hello at climate career week org. Email us and uh, we'll get you a, a copy of that presentation. But as Jamie said, uh, most of the, a lot of it comes from resources that are on the very excellent drawdown uh, website, uh, which includes the table of solutions, which is, you know, so many people's go to uh, 101 for, for climate uh, impact uh, and, and impact opportunities, as well as the amazing Drawdown Labs content that, you know, you've led, Jamie. Um, quick reminder, uh, Joan Barcelona and some other folks who have put, not to call you out by name, but who put things into the chat. Uh, if, you, if you've got questions you'd like us to answer, we're going to go be going off the Q&A function and also folks can upvote um, in, in the Q&A. Um, so, um, Jamie, do you want me to just kind of start with the most upvoted questions? Sure. Yeah, so we can start wherever. All right. Um, all right. So uh, someone who chooses to remain anonymous uh, wrote, we are a very small firm of seven employees total. Any suggestions for climate-friendly changes for a smaller company? Great question. It probably depends a lot on the nature of the company. Right. And yeah, Jonathan, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this too, as um, you know, you work much more with the kind of climate tech space and startups probably. But um, yeah, I would say kind of baking in some of these principles from the ground up, you know, if you're on a, you know, if you're planning on growing a lot, kind of having some of these um, these principles in place from the ground up, like we will, you know, we will plan to support climate policy where we can. And, you know, in, in the state where we, where we operate, um, we will, from the very beginning, offer our employees green 401k benefits. 
We will look into where we bank and where we keep our, you know, our cash on hand, which bank we work with and make sure that those banks are, you know, not invested in, in fossil fuels. Um, so I think, you know, kind of that framework that I showed is definitely has more relevance probably to larger corporations, but a lot of those same principles apply, um, you know, looking at how comp you know, how you're, are you disclosing any, you know, to, to the extent that you have a climate impact, are you disclosing that publicly? Um, I would say there are still things to be done um, for sure. And Jonathan, anything to add? Yeah. I mean, I think that um, the, you know, a small business often uh, kind of is a purchaser a lot like a consumer is. Right, um, and so just in the same way that you can be uh, as the as the leader of a small business, uh, I think you can make conscient, uh, conscientious purchasing decisions, as you alluded to, Jamie, uh, in in kind of all of the vendors, all of the things that you know. If you're having snacks at the office, thinking about um, those kinds of choices, and yeah, it's not going to necessarily have the same footprint as if. Facebook or Google made that kind of change, but um, it's, you know, always good to build in from the start. And um, there's also, you know, I think the impact of um, how, you know, how your employees work, right? So one of the things I found interesting, uh, Watershed uh, a while ago, I'm not sure if it's still up, they uh, published a uh, employee, like a, a calculator for the carbon footprint of a company's employee base. And they were doing an analysis early in the pandemic. And a lot of people were thinking, oh, um, your, you know, your employee base um, emissions would go down with remote work because um, people aren't commuting to work as much. And the interesting thing that they found was that um, if it, it's more about where employees live than it is about their commute, because uh, if you think about scope three emissions and, uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting question of how you quantify the, the footprint of your company. Um, but uh, people who live in suburban, uh, you know, kind of suburban or exurban or rural setting tend to just drive more for every day than people who live in urban settings, uh, you know, and can take public transit or walk or uh, ride share or whatever. So, you know, what, what um, Watershed found in this analysis was that companies that had more remote work didn't necessarily lower the, their carbon footprint of their employee base if you factored in where those employees worked. Um, so it, there's all kinds of stuff. And, and I think uh, you made some great points. I threw uh, Carbon Collective in the chat, which is a green 401k option, but increasingly, just like there are choices as a consumer, um, there are choices as a small business uh, to you know, make, uh, the sustainable, more sustainable purchasing choice. Um, all right, uh, next uh, most upvoted question uh, is from Joe um, asking about indigenous knowledge. So uh, if and how does Project Drawdown incorporate indigenous knowledge into climate, in, into Project Drawdown's climate solutions work and how can those in tech and corporate networks support equity and justice for indigenous communities around the world? Great question. Yes, yeah, so one of our, um, the climate solutions that we, that is included in our list is um, indigenous land tenure, because it's very clear that when indigenous people own and have the rights to their land, that land is not deforested. That land is not sold to developers. The, the you know, indigenous land practices are very, very good for the land, very good for climate change. And those forests are often very, very biodiverse, very dense with, you know, kind of absorbing a lot and holding a lot of carbon in those tree roots and soil. And so it is absolutely crucial that um, that we maintain the rights of indigenous people to their land and fight for more of it so that um, so that they're, you know, that they can be the keepers of their land that they've been for time immemorial. Um, and so so that is a, a an in independent climate solution as part of our um in our um in our natural climate solutions sector. And then I would say that um we don't call specifically call it out, but I think it is foundational to many of the other solutions. You know, I think 
part of the Project Drawdown's approach when we were doing the research around, you know, collecting all of these climate solutions back in 2015 was to, you know, to learn and listen to scientists and indigenous um, indigenous knowledge holders and traditional ecological knowledge and really included that in, you know, across the board. So um, it's called out in that one specific solution, but um, it really does permeate, you know, across across our whole system of solutions. Oh, fantastic. And I think I found it on the website and put it in the chat. Um, thanks for the question, Joe. Um, and so uh, Kirsten asks, any suggestions for employee advocates trying to work with our corporate sustainability teams to expand collective focus on some of the more contentious areas of climate action, thinking specifically about actions like addressing anti-climate policy advocacy through industry organizations or tackling finance emissions through the banks or companies work with? That's such a great question. I think this is really top of mind for a lot of people, right? A lot of employees right now. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there are two types of CSOs, maybe those that, you know, kind of want to stay um, maybe cushioned or or stay at arm's length from the um, the employee organizing work that may also be happening in the company. And then those that are like, you know, see it as as supportive to their efforts and want to reach out and, and bring it in. Um, and I guess, depending on what kind of uh, culture you have in your business, this response may differ. But, um, you know, I think, I think understand, yeah, I think kind of building a relationship where possible with the sustainability team, be, but being educated before you do that, you know, under, understanding what the current approach is. And if there is a specific policy that you're sort of like, why did we not step up on that? Why did we not say something about that to, to ask questions? Like maybe even line up a bunch of employees to ask that same question in a, you know, in an all staff meeting and to voice serious concern about that, the threat of, you know, like employees leaving or, you know, going, going elsewhere is, is real. And so um, I think that's one, you know, that's one strategy, but I really think getting like leveled up on, on, as you know, if there's a policy coming and you, and you're sort of like, this matters and I want, and I want my, it matters to me that my company aligns with our, our stated values on this. Um, you know, I think there's number one, there's strength in numbers, right? Like you gathering your employees. I saw Jonathan put climate voice in the chat, which is a group that helps work with em employee groups and, um, and put some public pressure on companies to step up on climate policy. Um, it is, I, I will say, I mean, I, it's a very, it's a fascinating from the outside. It's a fascinating dance. I think that like CSOs have to do with like maintaining relationships with leadership, and then, you know, kind of want it like wanting the employee engagement and activism to work to, to help move faster, but not being able to like fully engage with it. Um, but I, I, I've come to think of a barometer for me is if a company is serious about their climate promises, they will be supporting climate policy loudly and often, including on issues outside of their core business. Um, and so, um, yeah, I don't know, Jonathan. Do you have other other thoughts on? Well, no, I I, I mean here? I agree with everything you said, and I think like just having the question asked, um, Kirsten obviously is a very well informed uh, person, and we need more employees to be as informed as Kirsten because I think most employers get away with, oh well, we didn't lobby for it. The you know the Chamber of Commerce lobbied for or against it, um, you know, or some obscure trade group that nobody has ever heard of outside of Washington or Sacramento uh, that happens to be funded by uh, your employer, uh, you know, is the one that was doing the lobbying. And, and so there's this kind of plausible deniability that I think a lot of corporations have hid behind. And Climate Voice, um, I think, did a really good job in the, you know, around Build Back Better, which ultimately failed, right, of calling out and highlighting hey, look, this is what all of the, you know, these companies are actually doing with their money, their lobbying money when it comes to build back better. And often it was not direct lobbying money from the companies, but through those trade groups or industry organizations. And so I, I think just the awareness 
um, the more that, um, you know, the best disinfectant is sunlight or, you know, the more that, that employees just communicate to leadership, Hey, we know, we know what you're doing. We know to, where to look, um, that, uh, I think going forward, they'll think twice about it because obviously leadership cares about, um, appearing to be environmentally conscious or sustainable. Otherwise they wouldn't have chief sustainability officers. Otherwise they wouldn't be, you know, spending all the money on the initiatives they do. And if they realize that they're going to get called out for, uh, you know, that the lobbying that they do through these, uh, through, through these other cutout organizations is going to undermine the marketing value that they're already spending on, they might reconsider it. So I think awareness is, is definitely probably the first step. Um, all right. Um, Jin uh, says, it's definitely true that all the angles are important. Um, uh, from comms to external engagement, to community engagement, to internal operations, business development, recruiting, et cetera. I've found that there is a slight difference between companies thinking these roles are important. I'm guessing chief sustainability officer type roles are important and wanting to pay people to do them. Um, do you have any advice for breaking through the barrier and communicating value when companies still need to operate lean uh, and see short mid horizon returns? So I, I think it's more about like getting companies to build out uh, internal sustainability orgs, I think. Yeah, it's a great question. I've actually seen um, some really successful examples of employees who, where there was no sustainability team and it, one or two employees thought this, you know, I'm really passionate about this. This isn't my day job, but I want to like, you know, kind of look, start to investigate this and see what leading practice is. And they'll come to us and as at Project Drawdown and, you know, and ask what we think is best practice. And they'll start to kind of like socialize throughout that throughout the company. And at one company, um, I think that, I think I can mention it at Pinterest, um, that turned into an employee getting the job, you know, turning into the chief sustainability officer of the company. And so, you know, I think, I think that the more you can um, do the, you know, do the research, understand, and really like kind of skip over the, the sort of like um, not quite leading the practice of the last few years and skip over all of that and say, no, we're really going to do this right now because we're like, even if we're coming to the party late, even if like we're a few years behind some of the other big companies making climate commitments, we're going to like do it right. And um, the more that you can sort of lay some of the groundwork, even if it's not your job and build, you know, sort of like build relationships throughout the company of people who are in different jobs that can help scale this up um, and prove that it is, you know, a benefit to the company. It'll help with retention. It'll help with job satisfaction. It'll help satisfy stakeholders like investors that are going to be asking questions there. I mean, look, there's a lot of pressure coming at companies to address climate impacts and their climate risk. It is coming from surround sound, like all directions. And, and yeah, investors are going to be are asking questions, consumers, employees. And so this is just a this is just like a good move for, you know, for for any any company. If they're not doing this, then I, you know, if they're if they don't have like some sort of sustainability plan, like, you know, I would start one or start asking questions about why they don't. Um would be would be my advice. Yeah, and I think um also just you know it depends on the nature of the company. Like if it is a especially if it's a consumer focused company, then um you know there's a lot of marketing value potentially. Um but also I think B2B increasingly as other larger companies are looking at their supply chains um, you know, being a, there's marketing value in being able to um, not just to, to quantify and, and um, express to your buyers uh, in tangible terms. Uh, this is how we are, uh, you know, running our business more sustainably. And I think it will be a differentiator uh, for not not just employee, you know, retention and and 
attracting employees, not just for investors, especially large investors that that are feeling the pressure, but also increasingly for um, for customers, you know, B two B and B two C alike. Um, all right, Nishant says. Uh, you have any ideas of how to add sustainability work to an urban planning consulting firm? We don't choose our projects; we just submit RFPs for them, and so and so far have gotten no climate-related ones. Anything we can do internally to be more sustainable or get more successful bids for sustainability projects? Interesting question. I mean, that's a huge. I mean, that's that, that feels like a real superpower to be working on urban design. I mean, that's a core in the United States. Transportation is the biggest emitting sector. It's the biggest contributor to greenhouse gases that are, you know, that are, that are throwing all of our systems out of balance. So redesigning that is a huge, huge opportunity. Um, and so a lot, I mean, I would say, I mean, yes, there are, you know, there are things to do to reduce your footprint, but I would think more about, yeah, using that superpower. Um, so are there ways you can infuse your proposals with, you know, or kind of like just have climate be like an, like a, like a, yeah, of course, you know, in, in every proposal, like with every urban planning sort of project, you know, thinking about climate solutions, thinking about creating, you know, pooling, like places where the community can come together, um, where there's trees and where there's like more walk walkability and bike lanes and, you know, local food and, you know, just thinking, looking at, you know, climate solutions and thinking, where can I infuse these just as like, I don't have to be, you know, I don't know that you'd have to be like asked for it, but just like as a, this is part of doing business because we're in the year 2023 and we have seven years to transform everything about the way we live on this planet. And this is coming with, you know, like making that central to your business, I think it would be a massive um, opportunity and, and gift to the world. Well, and to your earlier point about like the pressure and the voices from all angles, like I have to imagine clients, uh, you know, my father-in-law happens to be an architect who works on a lot of institutional projects, you know, they specialize in lead certification. So, you know, like, because so many of the larger clients have that pressure to demonstrate that they have, uh, you know, that they're taking a sustainable approach to their capital improvement projects and their, and their building projects. So I have to imagine it could also be a differentiator in uh you know in attracting in, in winning some of those rfps to be able to say like we can help you um certify that this project is you know ticks those box boxes and, and is uh, appealing to folks on you know in, in this area um all right next up um we've got Kristen, kirsten again um organizations you've seen building employee advocacy communities across companies to share best practices and learning about how to influence our companies. We talked about Climate Voice as one of them. Are there any, any others, um, Jamie, that you're aware of? Um, I think work, does work on climate maybe also do some of that? Um, I know there's and then there's the slack communities that bring together you know industry specific uh you know like tech the tech community around the climate i think it's climate action tech brings together tech workers across companies to, you know who are work who are wanting to further climate action in their in their jobs um and that's a huge community there's marketing groups like that um there are let's see i think um we do a little bit of that with with our with the business partners that we at Drawdown Labs that we work with. We do a lot of like work with um, like for example marketing teams at different different of our business partners. Um, we'll bring them together to pilot some of our our job function action guides, for example. Um, but really, yeah, I don't. Other than that, I don't know that there are. Um, other groups. I know the Amazon employees for climate justice, um, who are, you know, who I mentioned early, earlier on are, are active through, um, 
I think through uh, 350.org to help mobilize employees at other companies. Um, so I, I know the Amazon employees are, are, are still active in that space. Um, but could be could be um, a, an interesting gap that you're. I mean, I think there's some work happening. I don't know that there's like an overarching coordinated effort to to bring those employees together and share best practices. Um, if anyone knows, put, any, put them in the chat. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I uh, yeah, and I threw I put them in the answer to the ones you mentioned in the answer to that question. Um, and I also threw in there's a climate designers, not quite the same thing as climate action tech, but you know, uh, focused on design practice um, across companies. Um, but yeah, that's a, and and yeah, if others have heard of ones that we haven't, um, please please put them in the chat. Um, all right, we've got uh, nine minutes left, and um, so time for a few more questions. Um, so uh, uh okay simon wants to know you know uh, a lot of tech layoffs happening now because of tightening budgets um how can we convince companies i'm sure this is something you're thinking about at drawdown in, in this changing environment um how can we convince companies to continue to make continue to make and make fresh investments in sustainability um when you know budgets are tight yeah this is a big question right now, for sure. Um, I mean, the fact is in most companies, I think sustainability is on the wrong side of the balance sheet, right? It's like, it's not bringing in money in in, a, in most case, in some cases. And I guess that, I think that's changing a lot now as as sustainability and climate tools are, are increasingly being monetized and can be sold. And that can be a revenue generator for the company. But to the extent that and I think that is why we sort of try to encourage companies to think about using their climate superpower or using their business model as a climate superpower instead of seeing it as this like reductive, this like thing they have to do. That's a sacrifice. That's like we have to, you know, do all these like things that's annoying. And you're like, no, this is about like building the future and companies have a lot of like, you know, I mean, the same way that during the pandemic, we saw, you know, big auto like sh shift from making cars to like making PPE or, you know, to making like personal protective equipment or other things. Like there are things that companies can do to transition their resources and, you know, tools and, um, and like factories to, you know, to, to, to building like heat pumps or, you know, I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is like sustainability is an important part of the business, which is trying to make, help the company operate more sustainably. Then there's also like, what if we looked at this more holistically and like, how does, how do we actually use like Salesforce's CRM abilities to help other companies decarbonize? Um, and that's something that can get, you know, climate action on the other side of the balance sheet, you know, helping, helping a company like use their, use their superpower or their products or technologies for climate action. Um, so that's one thing, but it's, yeah, it's very, very challenging. I mean, we get transparently, like we get donations from, from companies for, for some of our work. And it's, that's like very much on the, on the downswing right now. Um, and so it's a, it's, it is very disappointing and disconcerting to see that happen and to see sustainability teams you know, to see like my colleagues inside some big tech companies lose their jobs is like very upsetting because um, they're doing the most important work there is for the company. Um, so I'm really just reiterating your question without an answer, <laughs> but it's, it's a, yeah, it's a problem. And I, I think the more it's baked in, I guess my point, my, my answer is the more it can be baked into the company and not like an add-on, the, you know, it, then it'll be impossible to, to, to chop it off. But like, so that's why it needs to be integrated into policy teams, into HR, into marketing, into sales. It needs, sustainability needs to be embedded everywhere. And then it's in everybody's job, not just like, you know, the five people who have it in their title. Um, and, and I think you also touched on it earlier, right? The, um, the value, you know, I think it, it, goes back to some of the questions that we had before of 
demonstrating the value of this. It's not just a tick a box, right? It's not, it's not just to say that you did it um, or, or to feel good that there, there is increasingly tangible value for a company in making these investments. And the more you can kind of connect those dots, the better, uh, you know, as a quick aside, I used to sell uh, in my prior life, uh, I had an analytics uh, startup and uh, analytics at a, for, you know, a business companies, uh, you know, business customers is often seen as a cost center. And so it's like the first thing to go, it's very price sensitive. And so like, we were always thinking about like, hey, how do we show that this is not a cost center, it's a value driver, that if you're flying blind, you can't hear all the opportunities you're missing. And so I think that the more that we can demonstrate uh, corporate sustainability as a value driver rather than a cost center and, and connect the ROI, um, you know, the more resilient it'll be, but also infusing it everywhere. Um, we have four minutes left. So let's do one last question, if that's okay. And then we can wrap up and um, Jamie, you can kind of give people calls to action. Um, is there, Francois, um, is there, asks, is there a well-accepted measure of sustainability for corporations that employees can point to if they want to advocate for meaningful goals and stay clear of greenwashing? Great question. Um, so it, was it, are there, is there a specific standard? Was that the question or? Yeah, I think like how can employees, uh, you know, measure, you know, quantify or like reliably um, independently uh, measure if their corporations are actually doing good stuff or just trying to make it look like it. Yeah, I would say, um, I mean, it's really hard to met to be able to measure like emissions drop, you know, like emissions cuts. So, so the net zero goals or the, you know, they're really hard to measure unless you have, unless the company has like, you know, interim goals, but if the company's like, oh, we're going to be net zero by 20, 40. It's like, how do you begin to measure that? And I think that's why I really value for my own peace of mind, having barometers like, did the company publicly support climate policy? Is the company welcoming engagement from their employees? Is the company, um, you know, offering green 401k options for their employees or thinking about it. Are, there are other things that are more measurable than that are actually measurable that where, you know, net zero by 2040 is a very difficult thing to like wrap your head around and be able to try to measure. Um, but there are other ways that, and, and those are, and I, those are sort of reflected in the, in that eight part framework that I showed is, is executive compensation tied to the company's climate targets? Like, that's a pretty big, you know, test for me of if they are, then they're probably serious about it because nobody wants to, you know, have their have their compensation tied to something that they're not going to do. So I think there are other ways. Um, and I would just I would point back to like our framework. And then um, there are other organizations that do great, you know, standard setting. Um, but I really try to look at the very public, like, tangible things that I'm like, yes, no. Did they advocate for that? Yes, no. Are they doing this? Yes, no. Um, that's just like, an, to me, it's a, you don't have to wade through all the, like the murkiness to get to that answer. Um, that's, yeah, that's a, a good, good one to end on. Um, yeah, there's kind of shibboleths that you can see, um, you know, whether they're, they're actually uh, talking, walking the walk or just talking the talk. Um, Jamie, thank you so much for joining us. I put in the chat for folks, um, check out climatecareerweek.org. Uh, we've got more agenda, uh, more sessions uh, on the agenda. We've got job postings. We've got resources, a lot of the communities that we talked about here and Project Drawdown as well as on the resource page. Jamie, any last uh, calls to action for folks? <laughs> Uh, just we need it all. So yeah, I mean, I have been there. I've been in like trying to find my way in the climate space. And that's why I'm so passionate about everyone being able to contribute from them wherever they are and not having to like compete for a finite number of jobs. Like we need everyone. And so finding finding each of our climate angle is, is really, really genuinely um, so important. And it's the work of our lifetimes. So 